topics are there on the left, starting with hierarchy of movement, and then we're going to move down to scaling, ego, and then some little shorter subjects there. Okay? So if you're ever confused, like I said, just pull us up, let us know that you don't understand what we're talking about. It is about you getting the most out of this. Okay, so when it comes to hierarchy of movement, um, if you guys look at that there, right, if you look at the handstand walk, so did any of you do today's workout? Yeah. Handstand walking, cool. So we had some handstand walking in there. Um, and this is just the progression that you should take before you get into a handstand walk, ideally. So you should master each movement before you move on to the next one. So I know that as adults, you can read that and be like, hi, cold, kick up, yep, cool, I get it. Don't need to talk about this for any longer. What I want you to kind of think about, though, is if you think about this scenario. So, like, I wrote a little story. Okay, so you have a child with you, and they're, let's say, like, five years old. Maybe it's a friend's kid you're babysitting. Safe, safe scenario here that you have this child with you. And you decide that during your babysitting, you are going to teach them how to bake a cake. Okay, so you bring out all the ingredients. You have uh, eggs, flour, measuring cups, bowls, a whisk, all that stuff. And you lay it all out, and then this kid's obviously never baked before, never used an oven on their own, hopefully. Um, and then you have the recipe book out in ways that they can understand. So you have pictures and <laughs> it's, it's all laid out for them in a kind of clear way to go about it, right? So you explain, you're going to crack the eggs in the bowl, and then you're going to put the flour in this measurement, and then you're going to whisk it all together, pop it in the oven, wait for it to bake. Then the kid's like, oh, I got it. Go sit down, watch some TV. I'm going to make this cake for you. It's going to be perfect. You can just come enjoy it with me after. You probably wouldn't expect that kid to make that cake perfectly that first time, or even to come out with a cake, or even to crack the egg in the bowl without spilling it. Right? So I want you to think of this in that way, that these are the basics. We have to be able to do the basics well before we expect to be able to do a perfect handstand walk or bake a good cake. Because you can do a shitty cake, it's going to come out, you're going to be able to eat it, you're going to get through the workout with a shitty handstand walk, but it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good movement, it's not going to look good, and it's not going to help you progress further each time you do it in a workout. Okay, so just to break it down in a different way that we're trying to tell you to master each step in the basics and understand where you're at, and know that it's all leading towards something greater. So it's not that we're trying to hold you back, it's not that we're trying to tell you that you're not good enough, it's just understanding where you are. You're learning something new as an adult, that's pretty weird, we don't do that very often. You come in as an adult, you understand these concepts, you understand what a handstand looks like, you've seen someone do it, so you kinda wanna throw yourself in, but know that it's okay that you're learning a new skill and that sometimes you just have to take your time through that skill. Oh, so we'll keep that in mind through the whole thing, that we're just trying to tell you to move your best and to progress as fast as you can. You need to start from scratch, do well from there, and then take your time moving through each movement. Okay? So if we just look at these, I'll go over the gymnastics ones and then Riley's going to go over the clean. So we have a pike hold. Um, and this is all leading to the handstand walk. And when we look at these and we go pike hold and then kicking up to a handstand and just being able to hold onto a wall, wall assisted handstand, we want you to be able to hold those positions for a while. So not just show me for two seconds and then I'm like, good to go, move on to the next one. Show me that you can control it. Show me that then if I give it to you in a workout and you're tired, you can still make it look the same way. Okay, so it's about that consistency even under fatigue. Once you've kind of earned that, you can kick up to a handstand, you can hold a handstand for a good while, even when you're tired, you can still do that. Then we can go ahead and start to move you towards a wall walk. And many of you have done wall walks, and we can start away from the wall, and then we can work our way all the way into the wall. Once you've nailed a wall walk, then we go to our shoulder taps, freestanding handstands, handstand walk. So this is just an example. Okay? So if you are moving towards that, do you do the handstand walk before you're, you know, pretty good at these shoulder taps here, like I said, you're going to be able to do it, and you're going to get through the workout, but you're not going to then keep getting better as quick as you possibly can, because you don't, you haven't mastered the shoulder tap just yet, that body position or whatever it may be, okay? Same thing a lot of times with hanging movements or with kipping movements, so Yes, kipping looks really cool, it's really exciting, and again, it's not that we want to stop you from learning it. We can learn the movements in the skill work, you know, we have some time to work on that. We have gymnastics, sometimes I set you up and I say, go play, try something a little bit different today. We're doing it in a safe way without going for time or anything like that, but it's when we're doing this in workouts that we want you to just 
be honest with yourself about where you are in this ladder. Okay? So if you look at the um, toes to bar, so kipping toes to bar or glide kip, which is into the muscle up, is kind of the end goal. We should be able to do a seated leg raise. So a lot of you have done these in class. You're sitting with your feet in front of you. I ask you to put your hands down and lift your feet off the ground. And many of you start cramping straight away in the, in the quads. Right? And then when I ask you to jump up to the bar, you expect to be able to go all the way up into a toes to bar. So have to be able to do those seated leg raises before, sorry, before we go to our hanging leg raise and then strict toes to bar before our kipping toes to bar. So we only use these two, this one because of today's workout and this one because we see that the kipping toes to bar, everyone tries to, not everyone, but many people try to progress to that a little bit too quickly. Just know that if you nail those strict toes to bar and you can do those under fatigue and you can do three rounds of five, once we get into a workout and we get into kipping, you're gonna get a lot more out of that workout. And we're gonna talk about kind of getting the desired effect of each workout a little bit later on, so make sure that you kind of keep this in mind, okay? Moving over to something a little bit more complex, the clean. Okay, so pretty much the exact same thing as um, Alex has been talking about the hierarchy of movements. With the cleans, we do have the muscle clean, power clean, power clean with front squat and also the full clean here. But in saying that, there's also progressions before that. Um, you've got to be able to perform a proper squat. So you've got box squats, air squats, goblet squats, and then finally a front squat. That front squat requires a whole heap of mobility as well. Before we actually move into a muscle clean, you also need to be able to do a proper deadlift position. There's no point trying to muscle clean that barbell off the ground if you're rounding out your back and you've got so, so many mobility issues. So hierarchy of movement, you should be able to perform both of the deadlift progressions and also the squat progressions before we actually move towards this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, anyway, we've got a bit of a test for you guys. For those that are actually in exercise gear, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go grab a broomstick. A lot of you guys are, well, a lot of you guys will be expecting to perform like full squat clean with um, safely and also um, quite efficiently when a lot of people already struggle for the mobility in the bottom of the squat and also upper body mobility. So what we're all going to be trying to do now is with this broomstick, we're going to, going to try to go into a front rack position. You can use that chin, obviously that the, uh, broomstick is probably not going to sit the shoulders. And then we're going to go into a full depth squat and we're going to try to hold this for a minute, okay? Let's see how we go with this. I want to be doing it with you guys. So you need to be able to master the basics before you can actually progress. Are you ready guys? So it's your best front rack, your best squat steps. Rack. And down to the bottom. Heels should be down, chest should be up. Elbows should be off of our knees. Good. Elbows should be as high as possible, as high as possible. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, and rest. Yeah. Okay. You guys actually did pretty well, well with that. But basically, the whole aim of this is to show you that you should be able to master the basics with a broomstick before you add any sort of weight behind it goes the same with cleans. I know a lot of you guys say that you need to add a bit of weight behind that barbell, but in saying that you should still be able to perform a, um, the direct, like um, exact movement patterns and be able to um, go through those same sort of movements with an empty broomstick. Anyway, everyone understand that? Yeah. I yeah. your movement. Okay, let's go sit back down. Hopefully we're not sweating too much. Um, also understand that with that, like when you do see some of these people in the gym moving really well, like. So you can think of Rach and her handstand walks and how perfect they are. She has a background in gymnastics, you know, so she's learned that from very early on and it's been a lot of years of that. I've been doing CrossFit for eight years, Riley's been doing it for seven years. seven years. I didn't have muscle up three years ago and I owned a gym and everything and I coached and just was one of those movements that took me a long time to get. So sometimes we want to get everything as quickly as we can and we have our goals and that's really great but understand that it just takes time and by working on where you are at in the hierarchy of movement you're going to get there as quickly as you possibly can trying to jump ahead is actually going to slow you down if anything okay so that kind of leads us into scaling and the way that i want you to think about that is i think like sometimes people get into this mindset that scaling just means that you're like not good enough or some type of like lesser thing. And that's definitely not the case. All that scaling means, if we could replace that term, is your current ability level. So where you are at right now, that's your Rx, right? So whatever you're doing in your workout, you're doing in your workout, you're doing in your workout, and I'm doing in mine, it should feel exactly the same by the end of it. 
if we all do our proper scanning options or pick the ability where we are at today in our ability level. Okay, so it's definitely nothing to like be ashamed of. I hate when I go around and high fives and you did a really good job and it's like, yeah, but I scaled it. And I'm like, I'm gonna walk away. <laughs> so it's, you're, you did the best that you could where you are at in your CrossFit journey and in your fitness journey and where you know, you've come from and some of us have desk jobs, whatever the case may be, or injuries that cause us to have mobility issues or just genetically we're not quite there. So wherever that was your best of your day and you tried really hard and you potentially beat other people that yes, are maybe doing Rx, but it should be the same thing for them and for you. And you just did really well that day. So take those wins and don't always put yourself down just because you didn't do something that's written on the board. That's a guide for 200 people in the gym. You're scaling this down to where you're at. The workout's just written, again, for 200 people. So that goes with injuries, that goes with mobility. Take it for what it is and don't be afraid to say that you need to change a movement or that something's hurting or whatever the case may be. Don't just push through pain because you're trying to match something that's written up on the screen. Cool? Um, and obviously safety is a big thing. So when it comes to sc scaling, safety is number one. So we don't pull you back usually unless it's looking pretty unsafe and if you get injured then you straight away halt your progress you cannot train anymore so that's the last thing we want so if it is looking like you're gonna get hurt you're doing four movement patterns over and over and over for your knees for your shoulders whatever it is that's why we're potentially stopping you and saying hey we need to take the weight down or we need to change the movement not just because we feel like it or we're being assholes okay so the um extension extension onto that as long as you actually are performing the uh, movements fairly well not compromising form and also staying consistent with your training you are going to continue to improve so although you might feel like you're not going to get too much out of these scaling options as long as you stay consistent at it then you will improve and eventually work towards um, that full movement um, so it means don't throw your technique out the window to get those few extra reps ahead and try not to avoid those scaling sort of options to choose those harder options. I've got a few examples here. Uh, Alex has made me bring out one in terms of like myself. I um, avoid working on the scaling options with pistols, so the pistol squats. I know you, most of you guys will probably know what that is. Poor ankle range of motion and um, basically just trying to avoid it as much as I could. I ended up hitting a wall, so at a recent competition, not only did I get absolutely smashed by the judge, 40 no reps on one leg, <laughs> I also tore my um, uh, adductor trying to go lower. So I, not only did I hit a wall because I had to go back and continue to try to work pistol squats to improve, I also was out because of injury. So it like puts off training a lot. So um, yeah, avoid that, guys. Try to always take those steps to make uh, to get to that movement, and it will pay off. Avoid injury there. Learned, learned my lesson the hard way. The second. Um, example that I'm going to use is my very first training partner. So I started CrossFit with a mate of mine and we're both pretty much at the exact same strength levels but he chose to try to get those extra few kilos and extra few reps by muscling through a lot of stuff whereas I took my, like, my time trying to focus on the technique and although at the start it didn't really show because he was lifting more than me and he was beating me in a lot of the workouts basically my arm um, so coming like taking it back, working on the art technique and everything, I ended up outperforming him on Olympic lifts and in workouts. And um, it does like eventually pay off and you know, you're getting through it a lot safer. He would have he's got riddled with injuries these days and um, yeah and I'm still going with the sport. So it definitely pays off and it's a lot more efficient and just for the uh, long, uh, longevity of the actual sport or you know, competing as a sport or just fitness. It, um, yeah, try to follow the progressions, guys. Yep, um, and then on top of that, it does, like you said, it's more consistent, so it actually allows you to train more. Okay, so if we take today's workout, for example, snatches, snatches, including the overhead squat, full snatch, and handstand walking. So if you kind of went a little bit past your ability level and you end up sore in your lower back, that's the wrong place that you should be sore in a workout like this. You should never be sore in your lower back for handstand walking or for snatching, right? So if I stick where I'm at and I do the proper options and I come tomorrow and I feel fresh, maybe my shoulders are a little bit fatigued, but that was what was, we were trying to get at with the workout. 
someone else is coming in, they did the workout or X, they beat me or whatever, but their back is sore and now they can barely do the workout tomorrow. It just, again, takes them a step back. So you have to think of this in the long term and what your goals are. Do you want to continue training well or do you just want to smash yourself and then potentially slow yourself down? Then uh, quality beats quantity. I love this one because um, in terms of efficiency, so movement efficiency, like, um, although like, uh, actually movement efficiency at the end of the day moves faster anyway. So you may feel as though reaching that bar off the ground with more speed is gonna pay off because um, you're gonna be able to cycle that bar a lot faster. But if you can move more efficiently, um, basically you'll be able to perform more consistent reps, less rest, and eventually it's gonna beat yeah, I'm trying to reap that bar off the ground as fast as you can anyway. An uh, uh, example that I like to use of this is like a push jerk. For example, a lot of guys rush this, they don't catch it with locked out elbows and they're muscling it most of the time. At the end of the day, you're going to burn out maybe after five reps of whatever weight, whereas you might be able to push out eight or ten reps with an actual push jerk focusing on the technique and um, movement efficiency, saving as much energy as possible. So. Like, although you might think it's moving faster at the start, if you move consi uh, consistency, consistently with um, good quality, it will pay off. And then the final thing there, which is potentially like the most important, is getting the desired um, purpose of the workout that day. So when we program, when John programs in the long term and we get together as coaches and we talk about the programming, we've planned out a day that's meant to be a sprint. We've planned out a day that's meant to be heavy, that's meant to be lighter, that's meant to be longer. So if you're just always trying to go heavier and harder and whatever, and you're never finishing with the, within the time cap or you know things like that, then you're actually not getting the whole purpose of the entire training schedule. You know what I mean? So um, a good example for that one is a workout like Grace. Okay, so I'll have you know Grace 30 clean and jerks for time. So the bar starts on the ground to your shoulders over your head 30 times as fast as you possibly can. The RX weight for that, 60 kilos for males, 42 and a half for females, right? So elite athletes are good times in the sub two minute range. So when we program this as coaches and we get together, we think, okay, we want everyone to ideally finish kind of under that four minute mark. Well, if everyone can choose the weight that allows them to do that, then they're all getting the most out of it and that's what we want to get to. We might set a longer cap because some people don't listen, um, but, our whole thing, and when we brief it, and when we explain at the beginning of the class, is for you to get that desired purpose, okay? So with that, also, like to go back to the hierarchy of movement, if you, if you think about Riley's one RM clean and jerk, it's 160 kilos, okay? So that workout grace for him is 37% of his one RM, right? So a lot of times for a male, let's say 60 kilos, people are like, I can do that, I can do 60 kilo clean and jerks, if your one RM is maybe 90, it's gonna feel very different, okay? Even for me, my working weight is 48%. So it still feels much easier for Riley than it does for me, but I'm still able to just finish under two minutes, right? So we kind of tell you that sometimes, like, oh, percentage should be this. It's not just a blind guess, it's for a reason that we say that. So that's, again, just where you are at that day in terms of how much can you lift? Percentage of that, that's what we want. Okay? It's not less good than anyone else. Oh. Um, do we have any questions before we move on? Just anyone want to say anything? All good? Yeah. The, um, the idea, this is one that I sort of struggle with, is knowing when to move on. Hmm? Especially like with things like handstand walks and all those progressions there, but as well as the, any bar work, is that you kind of get that when you move on and you get yeah. to that, like you said, if you can hit that time cap of, you know, within that two to four minutes and you have scale, then maybe sort of scaling again or adding weight from there. You guys are always really good with, hey, this is, you see a lot of stuff, but if you've got 20 people in the class and you don't have the luxury of, you know, getting your gear for that five minutes while you're checking your weight and seeing where it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so you're actually a pretty good example to use for that because you're one that I can tell you, okay, you need to move on now. Yeah. And that's what we prefer as coaches, to look and be like, okay, it's time for you to start to push it and then you can go forward. Hopefully at some point, even if there's 20 people and two coaches, at some point within the workout, we 
take you through some progressions, give you a chance to test it. You make the best educated guess, we make the best educated guess. And then sometimes you get it wrong. Sometimes you overscale, sometimes you underscale, and then you adjust for next time. So it's important for you guys to record your scores so that you know for next time that was actually too light, that was too heavy, what is my 1RM, what percentage am I doing? Because you're gonna forget. Like while you're here, you remember, and then you walk out the door and... And the other thing is like usually in the brief, coaches, if, if you listen to everything they say, will say you should be able to do 10 reps in a row at this weight and it should make you feel like you're about to fail or it should make you feel like that was really easy and I could do 21. So they say that in mind with keeping in mind that everyone will hopefully pick a weight that allows them to do that. So yeah, you're right in saying sometimes they won't get around to you, but if you pick up on those little cues that they say, um, it's usually pretty spot on for everybody. Yeah. So I've had a few times there where I've kind of gone through some stuff, especially with handstand push-ups and you do all the scaling options and then I'll get you guys walk over and I go, <laughs> just so ready to go over and do some handstand push-ups. Yeah. And you kind of bash me out first and go, oh, shit. I didn't, didn't realise. It works. Kind of, yeah, it's like, it's great. But it was, yeah. it was more that, um, that self-assessment when, when sometimes you're not quite sure what's the self-assessment like. But that, that's helpful. Well, some, some of us doubt ourselves and some people think we can do it. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. like, yeah, which way you flip. But you guys would prefer that we're safe and that you yeah. have to yeah. encourage and us And that we have more to push you a little bit. Yeah. Throw himself against the wall. Right. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you have to learn the hard way, but hopefully most but of you. But you see one person do it and you yeah. Um, okay. So moving on, um, basically extending on from the old brace and stuff like that. How do you actually move faster? Well, it's actually about like improving your one rep max rather than like trying to reap that bar off the ground, like or your one rep max off the ground, time like time in time out. Basically, what you want to try to do is try to improve your overall strength. So that's going to make well, it's going to be able to make you pick up that bar more often with limited amount of rest. So you should be able to move faster. So. Not only that, um, increasing range of motion, so to get into easier sort of positions and more powerful sort of positions, that will um, improve your strength as well and also speed um, across the movement. For example, like a clean, um, if you can't get into a correct position at the bottom with the shoulders pulled back, it's going to actually limit the amount of force production, so you won't be able to get as powerful. So that's an example. So improving your range of motion, increasing the power will eventually. Um, lead to faster reps and stuff like that. So try to focus on that sort of thing rather than simply just trying to reap that bar off the ground at all costs. Yeah, um, and then this finally leads us into ego. Okay, so I don't want to talk about ego in kind of a negative way, like all CrossFit gyms have that role, it's like leave your ego at the door and blah, blah, blah. You don't walk in the door and ask coaches, we're like, that's going to be an ego right there and better leave it outside and we're going to bring you down a notch. No, not at all. So more so we can turn around and think like, just be humble and, and kind of like assess where you're at and be honest with yourself and where you're at and build off of that. So rather than just assume that you can maybe do everything, just be like, I'm gonna learn as much as I can from a hollow hold and build from there. And once like you accept where you're at and you enjoy the process a little bit and stop thinking about this end movement, um, you'll have a lot more fun as well, right? So just want you to um, understand that it can be, if you take a step back, it will actually make you go forward faster. And kind of, I've said that like 80 times now. So hopefully you've picked up on it. Okay, so ego's not a big one. I'm not gonna, like I said, sit here and be like, you are terrible, but just be, be humble with where you are and master every step if you can before you move forward. Okay, injury and fatigue. So um, basically in terms of injury fatigue, what we're trying to talk about that is, well, if you've got an injury or something like that, it's always good to actually keep moving. You don't have to, for example, with a knee injury, don't have to squat, we're not going to force you to go to a front squat. And if you do have an injury, by all means tell us, okay? A lot of people have got some knee pains and they just avoid it and just keep doing the workout. Um, basically, so tell us, we can scale everything and you can keep moving. By promoting blood flow to specific areas, so especially if it is a muscle sort of injury, by promoting blood flow, it will actually recover a lot faster. So it is always good to um, keep moving when injured or fatigued doesn't have to be at 100% effort, and it doesn't have to be um, 
those exact movements that were prescribed up on the board. So you can scale or change uh, specific movements to suit you. Mm -hmm. um, and then illness. So injury is obviously different to illness. If you're sick, rest. Seek medical advice. Don't come into the gym and get everyone else sick. Okay, listen to your body. Recover. Okay, so there's a difference between feeling a little bit tired or niggly or, you know, whatever. You can still train through that, but if you're sick, just let your body actually get better before you come into the gym. That's my opinion anyway. Some people can have a different opinion, but I just think you're run down. You're not hurt. You're not injured. You know what I mean? So you need that time to get better. If not, you're just putting yourself again back into even more of a deficit. So you're going to move backwards rather than forwards. Yeah. And it's going to be like three days off rather than a week off. Sometimes we get sick, it's okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, so pretty much adding to that, you can overtrain, and overtraining is actually going to, well, it's pretty much just going to um, do similar sort of things rather than not training at all. You can get lose strength, um, you can get sick even, so if you are overtraining, you can go, get quite sick. Injuries, adrenal fatigue, like there's a whole heap of things from overtraining. You do need to rest, so a lot of people think that you always need to go 100%, train seven days a week, you'll be fine. No, you, you will end up burning out and it's it's not great. So like me myself, like I train I train quite a bit and pretty competitively, but I still rest like twice, two days a week, like a minimum of two days a week and I do always still have downtime. So when I can, I go read a book, relax, watch movies. Like we've got the restoration zone upstairs, all that kind of thing. So ice baths, meditate, do what you need to, but you should always have rest days and you should always have some downtime to recover. So constantly just being at 100%, even like in here and at work, does tie you out. So like, there are all kinds of stresses and um, it, it does get quite a bit. So you just mentioned that you take like two rest days. So for people yeah. who aren't as competitive and calm and they don't give 110% at every workout, do you recommend? No. I do. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about um, things. Okay. Yes. Um, no, but you know, if, if you show up and you're like, okay, yeah. with it, you push yourself to the workout. How many yeah, days yeah. should a normal athlete that comes across it take off? Even then, if you still like, the thing is, I've adjusted my volume with how I've like adapted over time. Like I started like with just general CrossFit classes, and even then, I still probably would have rested twice yeah. a week. If it is intense for you and you feel like that's quite exhausting, those two days still give me quite a bit. If you like, you notice in things of like overtraining, like exhausting, possibly exhausted, unmotivated, bodies just hurting, then maybe that's a sign that you should be resting more than just like once a week. Like, um, yeah, it, it's like, it's different for everyone. Everyone uh, adapts differently to workouts and you feel as though, like the, just the normal sort of set, CrossFit sessions, like they are tough, like, are burning you out then. Yeah, it'll, you listen to your body. I guess what I'm trying to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and then external, so short one. In terms of your goals, you know, if you, you just started CrossFit or you're doing it for a while and you really do want to get better and you show up to things like this, so obviously you care a little bit more than most and you're trying to change your diet and you're trying to eat well and, you know, you have a group of friends that you've always hung out with and they just want you to go out every single weekend and get trashed. Kind of might be time to find some new friends or you know like you, you have a lot of things that are influencing you every day and you need to if you are really trying to train towards long-term fitness and health and um enjoying yourself as many days as you can in the week and not just like having two days where you write that off and then another two days where you're just trying to recover and whatever the case may be just know that like you need to surround yourself with people that have the same type of goals and that can help you a whole lot more than you think to continue to progress um, so trying to not get rid of those negative influences, but recognize them and maybe try to make some adjustments there. And then also work-life balance. Like, so I know, know so many people that are just working a lot every day, potentially weekends, don't ever get a break. Work's going to always be there. Like, I know if you have your own company and stuff, it's a little bit different. But just remember that if like, you do work for people and something happens, they can replace you very quickly as much as you think you're super important. Um, so you are the most important thing in your own life because that's all you really have at the end of the day, not in a terrible negative way, but just remember to take care of yourself. Like You're obviously investing a whole lot into fitness and into health and into trying to learn about this type of stuff. So do it in all aspects of your life because you're only really in the gym, hopefully, five, six, seven hours a week. 
so outside of that is the majority of your time spent. So nutrition, friends, all that stuff, really important, sleep, work-life balance. Okay, so think about it in a holistic way as well and make some adjustments there if you think you can. Okay, and the last thing, pretty much what we've spoken about this whole seminar, movement quality over time and speed, okay? So I'll use Grace as an example. Like, um, the chart. Oh yeah, they are mechanics. So first of all, you gotta um, get the mechanics, so you gotta be able to perform AR clean, say. So we'll go, we'll use Grace as an example. So you gotta be able to perform a clean and jerk uh, efficiently. Once you get that, then you gotta be able to do it consistently. So you should be able to perform rep after, like one rep, like let's say, make the first rep look like the last rep. You sh should be able to do it over and over again. There shouldn't be any, too much variance from the foot, like one rep to the next. Once you develop that, that's when you can start adding the intensity. So for grace, for example, that's when you can start to try to go those 30 clean and jerks for time. Um, if, you, if your reps do, for example, start to get bad at 15 reps and you haven't really followed, followed this procedure, you need to try to um, basically put this into every single workout just to stay, stay safe, everything up here. So prevent injury, illness, um, and stay safe. So yeah, that's pretty much what we're talking about. The whole, um, mm -hmm. seven, um, any questions about that? I was gonna ask, so you're saying like you've gotta get stronger, obviously you need to increase your one rep max. Yeah. Now obviously to get stronger you don't just well, how, what's the best way of increasing your one Squat next? a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Squat often and heavy. Yeah. So it's sort of like, no, but like, okay, you wouldn't just go one rep max each every day. But like, you know, is it best to work at like 70%, like 6 or 5 or anything like that? Like, oh, okay. it's just too general <laughs> question. The internet has just, a lot of yeah, there's, things. It's, there's like, well, I guess like working, working strength, so like a strength program, right? Like, there's a whole different, like a bunch of different strength programs out there, but yeah. I guess it's just consistent training. Like, but don't just keep doing one rep maxes. That's how you're gonna fry your joints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so you'll be doing it for maybe a year, and then your knees and everything's gonna be screwed. So I think it's best to work at those lower sort of percentages, low intensity. So maybe I'd say like 70 percent up all the way up to 90 percent, and you just vary the the reps and stuff like that. So it's typical strength training, and then just making sure everything else is on track. So. The, I guess sleep, nutrition, and, and stress, that, and everything. Yeah, like that. that was more to kind of understand that, like, to get better at grace. That's why I used our percentages. Yeah. You need to increase your one RM to make the workout weight feel easier. You know what I mean? You can't just keep trying the same weight to go faster and faster and faster unless you can make that workout weight forty percent of your one RM. It's not going to feel easy. Yeah. But you should be getting stronger following the programming, especially yeah. if you're kind of at the beginning, first two years of your CrossFit journey. Then you'll continuously see that peak go, 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 and then it kind of starts to plateau a little bit, and that's when you can maybe start to do some extra strength cycles and things like that, but don't worry about that too much. At the beginning, it's just to understand that, you know, how to actually make those workouts feel easier. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna ask. Like, if we, like, so I consistently train six mm -hmm. days a week. Like, I don't think I've missed a week of six mm -hmm. days, kind of thing. But then there's some things that I want, and I try and get to gymnastics and whatnot, but then there's some things that I feel like, I don't know if I'm just being impatient or like that I want to like load more. So then I want to try and concentrate on things like, okay, maybe I do like handstands for 20 minutes after the class. But I haven't really been sure like how to go about that because if I wanted to like add a bit, like what, when do I do it? Like, you know, around the yeah. workouts that are happening and stuff. Yeah, I think prioritize the classes always. Yeah. And if you are able to kind of hit that, not a hundred percent every time, but you know, if you hit Monday, Tuesday at 100% and then Wednesday maybe 80, 90 because of how you're feeling, whatever. But if you're consistently coming to class, you should be consistently getting better at things. If you find that you have goals, like I said, goals are perfectly fine. If you want to work on handstands, maybe pick one at a time because there's obviously yeah. 100 million things in CrossFit that you can continuously get better at. So just, it's hard not to get caught up and excited and that's something that we see a lot at the beginning and then people kind of burn out or go too hard and then end up with niggles. Niggles aren't normal, they're not good. We don't really get niggles very often. We'll listen if we do. Um, but just pick one goal at a time yeah. and then you don't need much, like 10 to 15 minutes of skill work, yeah. you know, maybe two to three times, two times a week after class or whatever you can fit it in. It doesn't need to be much. You just need to be practicing. Yeah, mm -hmm. pick one, I think. 
I've been trying to like, I'm like in my head thinking about all of them, but I'm not yeah. like doing any of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and what, just picking up on what they've been talking about, are you practicing the progression to get ready yeah. to, or yes, are you sir. jumping? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I on the stomach? No, I think you are, right? Yeah. You've been working yeah. on your kick up to wall. And it's about like, don't grasp Yeah, good point. Oh, yeah. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Yeah, so there's like charts like this all over the place. I'm pretty sure Darren probably sent you 10 emails at the beginning with a list of hierarchy of movements for every single movement that there is. So should be pretty easy to find if you are super confused. You can always ask us, but there's a lot of information on the Google on the internet. Sure. A question, Alex. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Matt answered this before, but it's been crazy. Um, so what's your one rep max body percentage with big three? Like, what should we work towards? Wait. I think Matt said three percent. <laughs> oh, wait, what did you say, sorry? Um, so like your one rep max. Yeah. So percentage of body weight, how much weight should you be pushing for your big three, like your squats, deadlifts? And how much weight? It's, it's going to vary. So basically, depending on the uh, What do you guys think is, well, what percentage should be? Oh, um, 300. <laughs> well, well it, like for like, like what kind like, of like level? Yeah. It, that's, it's very like, based on body it's weight, just it can be. It's just opinion. What do you yeah. Do? Um, for like an elite. Yeah. Um, it's like for health. It's, it's inconsistent. For, health. <laughs> for, like, for, like, for, like, for you. For you. Like, <laughs> like, well, how much? How much do you weigh? I'm sixty-seven. Sixty-seven, and I say for like um, like oh, it's, I think it's I really think hard to answer. I like, think a general thing for guys yeah. like double body weight deadlift, um, yeah. one and a half for a back squat. And body weight bench. strict press. Well, I mean, bench, 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 bench. strict press is small. <laughs> That's a goal to work towards. That's obviously yeah. like quite elite, but in terms of a CrossFit yeah. health yeah. and the highish level in a normal gym, that would yeah. be considered like a good percentage. One thing that you can do as well, if you go to like powerlifting websites or something like that, if you are wanting to. And like look at the into like more like intermediate sort of like range or the average they got like means of like body weight with their weights beside it yeah. it's the same with um so you got powerlifting which is the three and you've also got uh, olympic weightlifting which do something similar as well so if you want to compare up against those and saying that the average even with those is the average of competitors so it's still going to be very high yeah. so um yeah and it is Pretty broad question. Like it's going to vary, and it depends like what your goals are. Whether it is specific to those three lifts, and like if you like, if you are focusing primarily on those, what you want them to be. But if you're trying to go very broad and like focus on all of CrossFit, it's it's just yeah, trying to get everything moving up at this sort of steady rate. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? Do you all sign up for the open? Or? Oh yeah. yeah. CrossFit yeah. Open start a week yeah. from today. How, how do you sign up? Just on the app thing? On CrossFit.com or yeah. uh, CrossFit Games.com. 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 20 US dollars though. 20 US. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, of course. It's the rate, right? <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's a great week. It's in here. It's good fun. You're going to be doing those workouts anyway on Saturdays. So, <clears throat> so it's every Saturday for a week? Five weeks, yeah. Starting next Saturday. We might do it Friday nights as well, but have as well, or it's good. As well. Yeah. Also, Friday. Yeah, potentially. It should be good fun. Cool. Is, the Friday, is the Friday night thing sort of dependent on how many people? Um, it was only brought up today for a quick second. We didn't actually chat about it. Okay. So <laughs> we just haven't made a decision. But potentially. We'll let you know. Yeah. By Monday. So when is the first workout? Saturday. Saturday. Oh yeah, next Saturday potentially, potentially for, Friday. Yeah, potentially Friday. Friday. Yeah, Good. yeah so they release like, like eleven AM yeah, or 11 something on Friday. Yeah. So the morning will be a wad like as normal, just something we program. And then lunchtime as well. So only maybe the six PM, the five thirty PM will change to the open workout. And then the Saturday will be programmed as the open workout. So that's what we've been doing in here where you get a sheet, you judge each other, you kinda take turns, but what we'll do is on on the Friday, we'll have just the, depending on how long the workout takes, we'll have time slots and heat lists and you all just write your name in at what time you want to do the workout so that you don't have to be here like for three hours. If you want to be here, it's good fun, but just.
just for efficiency there. Sweet. All right. Thanks, cool. guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.